thanks everyone to be here today. I just gave a paper to be signed up in order to verify that all of you are here on site. Did you get it? Does it turn around? Okay, that's good. So I am very pleased to start this new year with you. Uh, I am teaching this course since now like uh, five years or so. Uh, we did work with, I am a geographer, I am not an economist, so I am a bit different from uh, the, most of the talkers who will be coming to these calls. And I am the one who proposed David Flaché, uh, who is the director of the program, to introduce uh, the ecological challenges as a course uh, in this master five years ago. So. I am very engaged uh, on the ecological topic as a geographer. I work mainly uh, on, uh, I am also the director of the Center for Earth Politics with different uh, scientists, some are geochemists, some are biologists, some are ecologists. So I've been working in interdisciplinarity since all my career. Uh, and most of the colleagues will be coming to teach you one course or the other, uh, our colleagues where, with whom I have been working. So, and I have been working on various topics because I did my PhD on animals in cities and urban evolution. Uh, so it's a very, very different topic from the one you, 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 you studying. And then I have studied biodiversity and urban biodiversity. And nowadays I'm working both on, on environmental justice and nature-based solution. How many of you know about uh, biodi urban biodiversity and nature-based solution? One, two. So do you know what it is? Can you define it, nature-based solution? Absolutely, bravo. <laughs> so this is exactly that. So I'm working on that in different cities and I'm working in Paris and for example, I'm working in schoolyards and to see with teachers and everyone how we can enhance uh, nature-based solution in order to better the urban ecosystem at different scales. And also to uh, renew the link between children and nature inside schools. And for example, we're teaching as a math teacher, we're teaching the math teacher to make his courses through leaves, for example, to learn to teach the small kids calculus with leaves or with twigs or with branches or with whatever they can find on site. So it's a way to renew the way we are being taught in different countries, because this is a European project. Uh, so just this introduction to tell you that uh, I have become familiar with economical uh, issues since I have been working with uh, my colleague, uh, welcome, uh, with my colleague uh, David Flaché, uh, and also because my laboratory of research is partly composed of economics. So uh, today I wanted to, to give a broad introduction to these issues. As a director for the Earth Politics Center, I work with many colleagues of different disciplines on what we call habitability issues. Uh, so habitability. Have you ever were heard of this word? What, what do you think it does mean? I mean, what, what is the issue? Nobody knows? Specific case what? Specific case well, uh, no, habitability, no, I'm going, so nobody knows. I mean, nobody can say, yeah? Can it be the, the condition for living? Yeah, for life. 
for life and living. I mean, uh, it's the two main points with more and more ecological catastrophes or a whole bunch. So don't forget to sign up because otherwise you will be forgotten. And so there are two main points. The first one is a, what we call the habitability emergency. It means that more and more spaces on Earth are going to be inhabitable. We won't be able to breathe or to drink water or to sweat even or to eat, meaning it reduces the Earth uh, spaces where human beings will be able to inhabit. So habitability uh, is a way to define the condition uh, with, uh, to which human beings are able to dwell in a place and live. So it's very important because this condition uh, is not only uh, atmospheric condition, it's not only earth condition, for example, that the soil uh, is still uh, living, uh, but it's also collective and political condition. I mean, as you can imagine, uh, sometimes uh, the political uh, organization of societies is so uh, catastrophic, then it doesn't redistribute. It means that a lot of people are not able to live in this society. So when I say habitability, I'm not saying it's only physical or biophysical condition of life. I'm saying it's a whole mix of biophysical, sociological, economical, and political condition. So we define the habitability as the outcome of mitigation. Right now, we define this as the outcome of mitigation and adaptation strategies aimed to meet planetary boundaries. Do you know what is planetary boundaries? Who, who doesn't know? Raise your hands in order for me to... So a small number, most of you do know. So we'll talk about that briefly, the planetary boundaries. And so the way we have to meet the planetary boundaries are through socioeconomic and political choice, as well as mobilization according to values. Once again, to live and to be able to live in a place will be our choice, collective choice, individual choices. So I'm not saying that we don't have some kind of freedom to decide what will be our future. Uh, but right now, what we see is what we call habitability emergency, meaning the place where we will be able to live in the near future are reducing in terms of surface. So how can we understand uh, how did we arrive to this state of catastrophe? I mean, uh, did you ever think about it? I mean, why, how come we an intelligent species? We were able to survive from many catastrophes throughout history. And right now, we just bumping into a wall, a very hard wall, and we don't seem to be able to turn and to change behaviors uh, and collective behaviors. So one uh, part of the di diagnosis is the fact that we thought that we could uh, exploit the Earth and all places where we left, lived uh, without taking care of its reproduction. It's important, this issue of, uh, of reproduction. We did ignore the importance of what we call biophysical materiality. We did ignore the living beings and their condition of lives. We did ignore many things uh, and we still uh, trying to know better about it. How do we leave corals? How can we reproduce them? How do we leave insects? How do, we, how do they go 
from uh, pollinating one flower to the other. Many things we don't know yet. I mean, you think we know a lot, and we do know a lot, but a lot of things about natural processes are still to be discovered. So, and this, I mean, natural science is only, like you would say, not uh, three centuries at the most. I mean, it's like a long process, uh, because science is quite beyond yet. So, and human societies organize themselves on the principle of predation, mostly predation, and then moving to another place when this place was exhausted. I mean, and right now, we can't move anymore. I mean, uh, except Elon Musk, maybe, uh, but he will be quite alone. But otherwise, uh, we can't move, and there is no planet B, as most of the activists uh, do say, and it's, I mean, we have to think how to, well, to, 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 to survive on this earth and to make it survive with us. So what are the ways out? It's very simple, but uh, in some way it's so simple that people do not think about it anymore. So a change of society, you will all be recruited in this matter, master for that. I mean, uh, every time Daddy talks to me, he says, well, they should be the best to change the society. You have plenty of good teachers, plenty of, well, uh, smart minds and such, and you have the future. So he says they're going to be in the best NGOs, the best whatever, in order to, I mean, try to tackle these issues. Uh, and also, there is this issue of implementing a sense of ecological responsibility. When you, I mean, it's nonetheless uh, a matter of culture. It's not only our behaviors we have to change, forced, force, uh, 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 force. It's also how our culture do change. How, how do we think that stepping on a, an ant, like, uh, do you know Jainism? No? Yeah, you know? Can you tell about this religion, which is the oldest on Earth, I think? I, I've only learned about it from a book by probably a white anthropologist, so I might say it's not this, but I think it's a, a, a religion in India where non-veganism is also any being, what is a very particular way of uh, a diet, and you don't want to hurt uh, certain forms of beings that are that need to exist in yeah, it's uh, one of the, I think it's the oldest religion, I've read that, but I, I can't remember exactly. Yeah? I was born into that religion. Oh, so you can talk about it. <laughs> That's great. So tell us. So I think, yes, all the organizations have to be correct. Can you speak louder because I'm a bit deaf? And all animals. Yeah. And that is like one of the reasons why like they don't use like for example like on it for like freeze, which is not exactly a freeze, but like I cannot find a one to one translation for it. So um, they do not use like air transport, they do not use any form of transportation, they always like walk everywhere and they do not like uh, use their like what do you call it, footwear because that might kill like some arms. Yeah, yeah, you sweep in front of you yeah. When you tread. Then every like evening they actually like apologize for like the harm they might have caused like accidentally. And even with like food they try to like reduce their ecological footprint. Yeah. Like I think in the current sense. And that is why like they don't have like a lot of things which come from like let's say the roots to the point where they also don't get to think like God because they might have like more bacterial content. So even like they don't want to kill like 
Yeah, it's very hardcore, but it's interesting to see that it's one, uh, one of the oldest religions, meaning that even when Earth, uh, we didn't have so much problems of resources, I mean, still there was this behavior and this ethical behavior which was uh, being held towards nature. And one of the most famous anthropologists, she was called, and I recommend you read her books, she was uh, English, uh, Marie Douglas, D-O-U-G-L-A-S. Uh, she wrote about consumption and diverse matters in the 60s mostly. And she wrote uh, one of the last texts in the 90s about how she thought that the only thing which could save the earth uh, could be religion. And I think she thought about maybe Jainism or maybe another one, saying that the only force in human society which do give way to some prohibition, uh, which is very, very thought-provoking because we more and more uh, not religious, especially in these societies. So do think about what could change our behaviors collectively in a very powerful manner. That's something to be, to be thought of. So this uh, is a result of, I'm going to give you just a few, uh, few uh, landmarks. So a short history. Uh, first of all, the explosion of human activity. You, do you know this? The Great Acceleration, yeah, most of you. So I'm not going to ponder about that, but uh, you have this very good paper, The Trajectory of the Anthropocene, The Great Acceleration, and you can find more data about it uh, in this paper. Another one, which is an image in between what was the land use in uh, 1700 and what is, was the land use in 2000. Uh, so it means the expansion of cultivated land, mostly, and also cities all over, and meaning a big destruction of forest, of uh, yellow and green of forest, mostly, and uh, this kind of land. Uh, so it means also that this great acceleration has a, a big consequences on the use of land. So there were some steps uh, in the environmental consciousness. I will go quickly just to give you some names, hoping that uh, maybe you will read some of them. You know the Meadows report, all of you? Le Club de Rome. This is a founding book uh, in all disciplines. Uh, it is a, a book which was written with mati mathematical modeling. More and more are coming, you being late, all of you. Uh, not all of you, some of you. Uh, and so the Club de Rome report was written in 1972, and it was written by these two people, Limits to Growth, uh, Donella Meadows and, uh, and uh, Denis Meadows, he still writes, I think, I, I don't know if she's still alive, but he still writes about uh, uh, these issues. Uh, he wrote a recent paper saying that uh, the democratic way of doing, of dealing with the environmental crisis will not be enough. So what they did do is to show that the components of growth are exponential. So it does concern you. I don't know if we should put on some light. Do you see enough? Uh, because it's like uh, there is a storm coming. That the components of growth are exponential. And if we don't do anything, we will eat the ceiling uh, the ceiling, uh, and we need to degrow uh, in order not to eat this ceiling. This was uh, the thinking in uh, '72, and what is very diff interesting in this uh, in this schema, uh, which was mostly a mathematical uh, modelization, is the fact that it was a systemic vision, which was not the case before. 
So it tried to put together population, uh, industrial capital, service capital, non-renewable resource reserves, and try to build a model out of it. So, and this was the first in 72 to uh, try to, 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 to tackle a systemic vision uh, before the letter. So, and this report is still in use, has been verified throughout the years and, and decades, and recently it has been again said that this report had uh, rightly uh, foreseen what was uh, coming. So another book which is uh, important, which is much before, but interesting, 1874, meaning that when one century before, uh, and it was uh, an American diplomat, uh, he published this book, uh, Men and Nature, and with this very title, The Earth as Transformed by Human Action. It means that as soon as 1874, and if you read, for example, Alexander von Humboldt, do you know about Alexander von Humboldt? Yes, most of you. And you read his Cosmos vision, I mean his book, which is a, a big book. And he tells us about uh, his uh, travels throughout America and also throughout other countries. And he tells us, uh, he writes about the destruction which was ongoing everywhere, deforestation and everything. And he had a clear vision of the path that would mean for the future. And we in the 19th century. That's the same for this guy. He saw uh, in 1874 that uh, the earth was globally transformed and not only locally transformed by human action, which is quite different. Question of scales and not only. Another guy uh, which was important, the Swedish chemist, Svante Arrhenius, and he put together the hypothesis of global warming and we're still in the 19th century. Uh, I haven't made, uh, I haven't written this slide, I should have, uh, a girl, a, a lady rather, in 1854, uh, I think, discovered the same thing uh, and her name is Eunice Foot, I think, or something like that. I can't remember her name. And, but as a, as a woman, she was prohibited to talk of it in public. So, and we rediscovered uh, uh, her works uh, much later on. So, and this guy was uh, the first to be, to, to talk publicly about it. Yes? <coughs> it's probably a little bit irrelevant, but how did they manage to figure this out in those days? I mean, it was like experiments in small, in small, uh, it was small experiments in chambers. Uh, and they discovered that, uh, uh, I can't remember the experiment, but it was small laboratory experiments. And uh, so it was just uh, not at the global scale. It was uh, uh, extrapolation that they would think that uh, it would have the same effect at the global scale. Uh, this is another book uh, much later on. Uh, so. Uh, and this one, do you know this one. I mean, this was a landmark for everyone. And it's a beautiful book. It's not only a book which was a landmark, but if you read it, you will see uh, she, she was a very good writer. She made us feel things. And if I uh, attract your attention towards uh, writing, it's because if you want to be persuasive, you need to have a way of talking and writing which makes it uh, translated into emotions. I mean, when you read Rachel Carson, you feel the birds are dying. I mean, it's not only a question of rationality, it's also a tale, a story if you want. So this is a French, I mean, how many of you are French? Oh, seven, okay. 
So this is a French. It was uh, later on, 65. Uh, my thesis was about the urban ecosystem. It was beginning of the 90s. At the time, there was nobody who had studied the city as an ecosystem, except these guys of the 70s. And that was much before. And they were studying urban ecosystem as a system, meaning like a, a metabolic system, meaning there are so much uh, energy which is getting in with food, with everything, and they converted every matter which was going into the city or into a place in kilocalories or kilojoule, in energy. Uh, and vice versa uh, of the matter which was extracted from the city. But so you can uh, uh, see that this guide had very interesting thoughts about a lot of things, but when you talked about uh, the Joconda, the painting, which is in the Louvre, I mean, you can convert the Joconda in kilocalories, but you won't say anything about the painting itself when you convert it in kilocalories. What do you say in terms of value? I mean, that's also uh, uh, one of the questions at the time. OK, this guy you know, Krutzen, who has heard about this chemist, is the one who, who, who labeled the word Anthropocene in 1995. I think it was in 1995, but maybe it was later on. He had the a Nobel Prize of Chemistry, no? Meaning that the, uh, his, uh, his paper was called Geology of Mankind, the Anthropocene, first paper on this issue. So you have uh, to look at it if you're interested in these issues. And this is a very important uh, report also, 2005, uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment because Amartya Sen was part of the writer who wrote this, this, uh, this report, and he tried to, 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 uh, he tried to put values on, the, on biodiversity and different processes. And we talked about uh, ecosystemic services and also of the fact that us, educated urban people do not directly need nature, but a lot of people in many countries do directly live off nature. They need the water which is in the rivers, they need the wood which is in the forest and such. So, and he said that if we destroy biodiversity, the people who will be the most hurt are these people who live directly of this nature. So, and he was one of the first to say it in 2005, Amartya Sen, who had the Nobel Prize of Economy. And uh, so they talked about this kind of schema in between ecosystem services and the constituents of well-being. So 2005. Uh, and that was also, I mean, if you don't know the history uh, and uh, the history of power, I mean, there is a big difference between climate and biodiversity. Can anyone tell me what is the difference? And I'm not talking about geo-biophysical difference. I'm talking about political difference. Do anyone have an idea? No, no? <laughs> Well, you, <laughs> you seem to have so many ideas, that's good. <laughs> I guess um, biodiversity is maybe a bit more concrete. Uh, and for example, you know, uh, I guess you feel a bit more when you see a panda or a tiger um, versus a panda, which is a bit more abstract. That's very true. When you work like I did and still do with NGOs, you still feel that uh, when they talk about biodiversity, they talk about concrete stuff while climate is more a technocratic sphere, but it's not where, uh, uh, where, uh, uh, what I wanted to say. Climate appeared on the political agenda in 1990. It was even before, in 1972, first time there is a huge conference, international one, about climate issues. 
And the GIEC, IPCC, uh, was created in 1990. Does anyone know about the uh, Biodiversity IPCC and its name? Who knows about the IPCC for biodiversity? It has a specific name, specific dates, and it was in created when? Do you know? Yeah? Yeah, it's much more recent. It was created in 2010. Uh, it's called the International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It has exactly the same way of functioning than the IPCC. It is about biodiversity. And do you have an hypothesis why it was created so much later than the IPCC about climate? It's just you have to think, I mean, like you did exactly what is concrete, what is abstract. It's a power play. Mostly it's a power play because climate scientists were at the beginning only tackling uh, modelization of global matters. So directly they had an influence at the higher level about what was going on and how they could modelize, mo model it, modelize it. What about biodiversity? Who gave the alarm? At what scale could we give the alarm about biodiversity erosion? I mean, mostly biodiversity was, uh, the, uh, the, uh, was uh, taken care by activists at local scales, in different countries, who were not talking to each other. So they saw that such species or such species was disappearing, but they didn't have this global power. So, I mean, the construction on the political agenda of these two objects of preoccupation, climate and biodiversity, are very dependent of the construction of the power play. And that's very important to say and to underline because biodiversity erosion is as much a problem as climate uh, warming. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, this is more of a question, I guess, to that point of the prioritization, but does it also have to do with the fact that, you know, the effects of biodiversity loss, like ecosystem collapse, is harder to track or takes longer periods to track, whereas I was remembering as Lucienne was talking, you know, like around the time that this was starting to be prioritized on the climate science perspective, it was, you know, the hole in the ozone layer was the big kind of stark, you know, example. So is it is it also just like our ability to see ecosystem collapse is a little bit more delayed? No, it's, uh, it's uh, many things at the same time. For example, do you know the paper of uh, this economist who had the Nobel Prize in uh, William North? North? No, 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 I think. Do you know this paper? Uh, uh, this guy was very much criticized because he said we can replace uh, natural capital by uh, socio-technical capital, meaning that we didn't care about biodiversity because mostly we thought that we could replace it. And that's what's going on. I mean, when you see in different places, we do pollination by hand with uh, 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 poor jobs, you know, like uh, women, for example, in different countries trying to uh, put the, 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 the pollen in different flowers in order to have, well, different things because insects are dying. So I think that uh, one of the reasons was the fragmentation of activists, not uh, enough organization at the global scale, but also the fact that many thought that the disappearance of nature was not serious. I mean, uh, we could replace it mostly. I mean, humans were smart enough to replace whatever uh, process were uh, aggravated. And that's why in 2005, when this report was written, they uh, tried to underline how important is biodiversity, you know, because they say it's provisioning 
it's regulating, it's cultural, it's supporting with nutrient cycling, soil formation, primary production, and it gives that. Basic material for a good life, health, good social relation, so security, and all this was totally modelized around in between uh, beginning of the 2000 and 2005 and afterwards. This is, uh, I was part of the French group to modelize uh, ecosystemic services for uh, cities, uh, and uh, that was part of what well, I talked earlier on about nature-based solution. When you bring nature in cities, you're supposed also to bring that. Uh, that's the idea, at least. I mean, we can be, and I am very critic of this kind of modernization, but it is where we stand today uh, in science. So, I oh know. So, uh, what about planetary boundaries? So, some of you know about it. And one question, is it a communication exercise? Is it more than that in terms of play of power, political game? Uh, why do I ask the question? Okay, I'm going in detail about that quickly because I can be very long. And uh, so, 2009, free bound. So, uh, the nine uh, boundaries are freshwater use, land system change, biogeochemical flows, like nitrates, for example, or like. Uh, uh, ocean acidification, which is very much linked to the carbon inside the water, uh, atmospheric aerosol loading, ozone depletion, and also novel entities, biodiversity and climate change. So we have these, you know, different uh, boxes, you would say, and all ways of controlling uh, how it is going at the global scale about that. And in 2023, it's six boundaries were crossed, which means that we targeting the ceiling of all boundaries very quickly now. And also the schema, which was... Uh, uh, have you ever re read the work of Rockstrom? Rockstrom, Johan Rockstrom? So he's a very powerful man, um, like it or not. Uh, he's the head of the Earth Commission, which is based in Potsdam, I think. He is uh, uh, working uh, as a scientist, a physician, uh, on all kinds... This is very strange. Uh, he's working with uh, many scientists uh, in this Earth Commission in Potsdam, advising and being like the great eminence of many state, uh, head of the states. Uh, and he, he was the one, the first who wrote about that, Johan Rockström. So, and uh, so you have this kind of thing also, trying to see what are the control variables uh, the planetary boundaries, the base value, pre-industrial. So you can see all that on the site and in diverse paper. You type Commission Earth, Rockstrom, you'll find plenty of papers. It is very uh, well cited everywhere. So, and there is upper end of zone of increasing risk and current value of control variables. So you can have all the details of the work he's doing with many colleagues there. And uh, so it gives you an idea where we stand regarding these different uh, control variables. So what is interesting? So I'm going to give you some critique in order for you to know how to think about these ideas. What kind of critique could you make uh, to this kind of schema? For those who know about this schema, it's easier because you, uh, you have already thought about it, I guess. Yes? No, it does not specially criticize the ecosystem services. It's different. It doesn't stand in the same place. It's more a uh, representation of the ceiling of Earth, somehow. 
It's uh, yes. Absolutely. So it's already including a kind of more social perception of the state, like yeah. the state boundaries. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is no, but uh, recently, since like I would say a few years, uh, some social scientists joined them uh, in the Earth Commission in order to think about justice and social preoccupation because they had so many, received so many critics like yours that uh, they were some sort uh, obliged. Yes? I know, in, I know in some places they have like tried to address this, but it internationalizes or globalizes all of the environmental problems. So obviously like deforestation is something that happens on a local scale and is disproportionately um, balanced across the world. So it kind of erases the uneven distribution of environmental harm. Yeah. It's uh, one question is the fact that we have, and I will go on that uh, uh, further on a bit because I think it's important, it's ongoing everywhere, is how we can make land uh, these uh, planetary boundaries, meaning that each place is not effective, affected with the same uh, type of uh, dynamic. Uh, between biodiversity, climate change, and everything. So we have to make it land in a political manner. So, uh, first of all, one critic you find, uh, I, I put the critic in yellow, and some of the good points in white. One of the critiques is the fact that the Earth system science, we call them like, uh, we call these scientists like that, we call Earth system sciences. It's a new field of science in some sorts, of system scientist. It's a new, uh, it's a new discipline, a new subfield in some sorts, and they still have to find their marks. I mean, they're a bit young, and some say that uh, they do uh, occupy a lot of the mediatic attention, even if some are not so certain about the equilibria. Uh, which are uh, being discussed. Also, the declination of planetary boundaries according to territory uh, with the problem of subscales. This is a big problem, the problem of subscales. I'm trying, I have this conference uh, in Venice in, uh, in one month about subscales. And we see if you go on a territory and you say, I am going to use this tool of planetary boundaries in order to implement new policies, what do I do? At what point do I say it's my territory, which is a problem and not? Uh, for example, uh, uh, we had a problem with Brittany because there are a lot of pigs there being raised, but they are being consumed uh, elsewhere. Uh, so should we reduce the pigs there? I mean, you can see the kind of politics which is uh, the other critique is too big a role given to science and not enough to politics, which goes in your direction. Uh, another critique is the fantasy of a rational top-down government after this, you know, nice schema, um, but which is only uh, uh, the illusion of planet Earth. We don't know we live on the planet Earth if you don't know all that. So we do live, but what kind of illusion of fiction is this schema? Um, and by focusing on top-down control like this one, we are uh, avoiding the real entrenched problems uh, like industrial interest and economic interest and technological infrastructure and such. So you could say that this schema is very much depoliticized. I mean, that's, uh, so on the other hand, uh, this schema had a strong impact on the research community uh, of uh, power of integration. Many scientists of different disciplines came together to work on this global equilibrium, and which is important because before and 
some were focusing on climate, some were focusing on biodiversity, some were focusing on water issues and such, but nobody was focusing on the whole. And that was an important step because otherwise you're not going to see how much all these problems are linked, are interlinked between one another. Uh, so also when we say it's not, uh, it's an expert driven schema, we forget that for many NGOs, this schema is a powerful tool to address uh, awareness about these issues. So yes, it is not very, it is very depoliticized as such, but it works as a communication tool for many people. So it's not black or white, it's in between. And also uh, it raises, when we say it does obscure the real problems of entrenched uh, industrial interest, we forget that it raised the issue of degrowth, which was not the case so much before. So uh, in the same time, yes, but no, because it raises the issue that we can't expand anymore. There is this earth ceiling, which means that, I mean, we won't go anywhere in, uh, anyhow. So this was, uh, and there are plenty of papers. Once again, there is, uh, uh, this paper is a very good paper. Uh, I liked it very much. Uh, there are plenty of paper about these issues. And to go uh, quickly about, uh, this is a very complicated problem. Uh, let's see. So uh, there was one paper, where is it? No, it's on the previous, uh, which shows, so I'm going to use, yeah, the, the, the paper is here. Uh, it's called Allocating Planetary Boundaries to Large Economies, Distributional Consequences of Alternative Perspective on Distributive Fairness. So it's a very interesting paper because it tackles the issue, how do we allocate uh, what is left to be consumed, not only on carbon, but on different things, biodiversity and such, uh, in land use or in water, in different things. Uh, do we say uh, these countries who had nothing to do with climate change do have the right to consume more? Or do we say these countries which are used like the United States to consume a lot, uh, they have to maintain a certain way of life and how do we distribute the power to decide? I mean, it's a very complicated uh, issue and they uh, talk about that uh, and they show uh, that according to, there are three ways. Uh, I don't know why there is that uh, because it's not on my screen. So there are three ways, uh, uh, what we call grandfathering. You know about this way? Grandfathering means because your grandfather did like that, you have somehow the right to keep on going like that. Equal per capita shares, meaning a distribution uh, according to uh, population, and also uh, ability to pay uh, to reduce environmental pressure. In this paper, you will see, for example, for CO2 emission, for cropland use, for biodiversity uh, loss and such, uh, what are the countries and region shares according to these three ways of establishing uh, rights? Uh, grandfathering, capacity to, uh, to pay, ability to pay an equal per capita. Uh, so this is a way to envision how we're going to distribute uh, what is left uh, of what we have to consume of the uh, capacity of the earth to reproduce itself. You can say it like that. This is only one paper about it. There are plenty of papers about it. It's, uh, it's a very hard question and you could say it's a very fictional uh, work because 
who, who has the power to decide? In fact, I mean, do you think that all countries are going to get together and say, yes, that's good, because you Europeans, you have the, 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 the custom to go by uh, driving to wherever or to take your vacation with plane, you should keep on going because it is your custom, this is your culture. I mean, who is going to say that? Uh, you know, uh, so plenty of questions uh, behind that. Uh, this is the same thing, grandfathering, equal per capita, bivetete. So you, you can read this paper. Uh, I'll give you the reference if you're interested. Uh, this is another exercise of the same type that has been done in France uh, at the scale of the region. They try to uh, say uh, we're going to use uh, in between regions at the scale of France the sharing principles meaning we're going to allocate a global quantity of acceptable ecological budget. I mean, it's something like uh, uh, you give a budget uh, and you try to see what kind of uh, uh, points it raises uh, in terms of ways of life, in terms of uh, local life, yeah, and... Uh, and what is important also is that you use this uh, variable uh, for allocation and what, are, what is the principle you use behind that. And most of it use egalitarian principle, meaning we, we, we share the budget according to capita uh, number of people living in a place, which is not very fair. I mean, you can say, it's, no, no, it's not fair. So there are plenty of, of questions of justice behind it. And if you use it, uh, this boundaries uh, schema uh, in your country or in your region, you have to think about that and read these papers in order to get uh, more knowledgeable about that. <laughs> so this, you know, uh, it is a Kate Haworth uh, schema, which says we have a plancher, how do you say plancher de um, no, ceiling, it's above your head. No? Plancher. Uh, floor. floor. Yeah, this was supposed to be the floor and this was to be the... Uh, this is a fiction, total fiction. It's the same. I mean, you can say that, but this is an image. Who is going to say something about it? Once again, it's the same thing that with biodiversity and climate issues. When you look at the political agenda, you see how, if you want to be uh, pragmatic about the, the climate ecological catastrophe, you need to see what, where, where is the power balance. Because otherwise it's... Uh, but this schema had a, a huge success. And so this is uh, France, I think. Uh, yeah, and this is Ghana. So you can see biophysical indicators and uh, where uh, ecological seeding, uh, social foundation, and France is over the board everywhere, as you can see, red. Uh, and Ghana is under the board, you could say. So there is a, they try to do this kind of calculus. And there is also uh, this one, uh, has been worked on by Gupta. You know Gupta? No, she works at the Earth Commission. She is a social scientist and she works on the principle of justice at the global scale too. Uh, and she did the free eye justice criteria to analyze the safe Earth system boundaries. So she has three principles of justice I won't go into the detail because it's very complicated. She has interspecies justice and earth system stabi stability, intergenerational justice and intragenerational justice. So what is interesting in, uh, in her work is the fact that she works with time, not only with space, and not only with the space being today, she works with time and she works also about 
uh, interspecies justice I mean, uh, and rights of nature. So it's again very abstract, but it gives some idea about how we could work on these issues at different scales. So, okay. Uh, do you know this work? Daniel O'Neill, 2018. No? So 2018, and he talked also about biophysical boundaries transgressed. And he took all countries in 2018, and he tried to see where each of these countries do stand on this uh, schema. So this is where the biophysical boundaries are transgressed. And this is where the Kate Haworth a social threshold are achieved. So, for example, you see uh, United States, which is here, do transgress a lot of biophysical boundaries without achieving so much when being at the, uh, on the social uh, board, which is not the case, for example, of Netherlands. Okay? Uh, and you can find all this for example, Russia, Turkey, Iran do transgress a lot of biophysical boundaries and do not achieve any uh, so much of social, uh, social well-being. Is that clear for this schema? And you see Vietnam is a bit isolated and it's a strange uh, isolation, I think. Yes? So what is meant by social threshold? So education. Uh, employment, uh, access to health or lodging, I'm going to show you. It's, uh, they have, uh, so life satisfaction, healthy life, nutrition, sanitation, income, access to energy, and all that. Meaning, how many, how much do you need to transgress in terms of biophysical boundaries in order to achieve this kind of well-being? And you see, if you look at the position of United States or, other, or even Spain, that uh, it's not strictly a balance. But nonetheless, it means that you can't achieve any of this social well-being without transgressing planetary boundaries. It means that we have to revise our ways of building up our societies because the only society which do not transgress are very low-consuming countries. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, countries which are considered as being very poor nowadays. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yes. So I'm going to show you some uh, boundaries, but I think most of you know that, climate change. Uh, you will have a course about climate change. My colleague, Nathalie de Noble, who is coming to, to, to give you this lecture, is a specialist of it, and she's uh, at the end of a major project about these issues at the French level. Uh, so it's, uh, she's going to talk about that, and uh, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, what you can see is, uh, well, this kind of, uh, she will show you this kind of simulation, what is observed, what is sim simulated, if it's only natural warming, and that's how we calculate how much uh, human activity has an impact of, of climate. It's a question also of modelization, observation, and simulation. She will show you many things about that, about climate. And this, uh, this is the French COP in 2015. Uh, I mean, we don't like them. <laughs> so whatever. But uh, that was the first time uh, that uh, even if it was uh, retrospectively not a success, because uh, not much was achieved through it, that uh, 196 countries came together and signed up a deal in order to 
uh, lower the, the, uh, the gas emission. And another thing also, uh, so there were, there were no legal constraints at the time, no capacity, but specific target, and what we call nationally determined contribution, NDC, and you'll find it on all uh, adaptation to climate change plan in different countries, at the national level, and even sometimes at the local level, the NDC. So, uh, okay, and it was supposed to keep the rise of uh, mean global temperature below uh, 1.5, and as you can see, we're not going to reach this target far from it. So it's a bit sad. Uh, so, okay, I'm not going on that. It's... Uh, Another word, because my colleague Francois Sarrazin is coming at uh, 4, I think. Is that it? Yeah, 4.15 or something. Uh, so in one hour, it's free. Is that it? Yeah, in one hour. He's coming to talk uh, about biodiversity issue. He's a specialist of that. Uh, so I am a bit troubled to give you more about it because uh, it will give you, so I will give you just a free few words uh, in order if you want to ask him questions, maybe we'll go into more details than I am able to do, uh, but I think it's important that, uh, so what is biodiversity? If you look at these three schema, I put them uh, in order to give you a riddle of some kind and in order for you to to ponder about what is biodiversity. Uh, I'm sorry it's in French, uh, but if you look at the images, you can guess what it is about anyhow. So you, you have to take into account the three images in the same time. Yes? What? Yeah, absolutely. Yes? Is it complex to have to ponder um, all the living organisms and their, uh, and their dependency on each other? And they cannot survive without the output of one or other animals? So, how long are the climatic conditions and uh, other things that they live in? Absolutely. But it's not the only. Yes? What about adaptation? Oh, adaptation is very much uh, a question. I'm, living, I, I'm, always, I'm reading right now a book which is called Darwin Comes into Town and how birds and other species are adapting, are adapting themselves to <laughs> urban life. So, it's very interesting adaptation. Yes? Yes. Um, I think like the, the one on the right also shows this like historical dimension or like also evolutionary dimension that it's not only in one snapshot of time everything Absolutely. depends on one another but also through time <coughs> and that there's always been a sort of evolution that things change as they adapt but also yeah that the current situation is probably the past but this is something else as well. Yeah, there is a question very much of temporal uh, temporality. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So I put always these three images together. This is time. And there is no biodiversity that we can think of if we don't think in terms of time and evolution. And it's always happening. I mean, for example, lizards, uh, we have like a different uh, kind of evolution in cities, lizards. Uh, because we have more and more glass building, they have learned to, they have learned, not learned, but evolution made them uh, change their, I don't know the name, you know, the way they stick 
on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on walls because uh, glass uh, walls are much more uh, slippery than the other one. So, uh, and that has evoluted, uh, permitting lizards to live in cities and uh, climb over this kind of building. The same for birds. They have evoluted, a lot of them, in order because the, if you close your eyes and you stand in a park, for example, in a city, try to see what kind of acoustic range uh, do occupy uh, the city noise. And try to understand where is the room for birds in order for them to communicate, for the female to say, yes, this is reproduction time, for the babies to say, yes, it's time for feeding. So the, for a species to survive, there needs to be place, room. And so all these species have been uh, accommodating themselves with new ways of life due to our activities and the impact of these activities. For example, which is a very different example, but I worked on it on the genetics of cats. Uh, Stray cats and wild cats in rural areas are behaving, they are very territorial animals, like rats in cities. For example, you have the Seine, the river. Uh, rats on the left bank do not cross to the right bank. So it's not the same rats. I mean, this is what we call, they have evoluted separately. So, okay, because they don't, they are very territorial animals. And cats, uh, in, uh, in rural areas, uh, one male uh, with plenty of females, and in cities we find couples. Uh, because it is a very fragmented territory and uh, where resources are distributed uh, unevenly. I mean, it's a question of resource, uh, fragmentation and danger also because, uh, for example, many species do not cross a street or do not cross a motorway. So, for example, in Paris, you take a, a species of snail, which is in a certain place. It's not the same species of snail, which is in another island. For you, it's just a roundabout. For the snail, it's an island. So you have to change the way you see our impacts on Earth, and this is evoluting always. So th there were five extinctions before, and we're talking about the sixth one. And my friends, some of them who do not know anything about these issues, do tell me, yeah, well, there were five extinctions before, so biodiversity will recover. What is the difference between this extinction and the others? Yes? Well, if you talk about uh, meteorite, me, 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 meteorites, I don't know how do you say it in English. I mean, the dinosaurs found it, I guess, very fast, very quick. I mean, you, do you know how long did stay the dinosaurs on Earth? 250 million years. We've been on this Earth not so long, not even one million. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, what is the difference between this extension, which is ongoing, and the other f five? Is this self cost? What? Self cost. Yeah, it's, uh, what, what do you mean by self cost? Uh, it's, it's uh, upon the same species, so yeah. it's eliminating itself. Like yeah, we're eliminating ourselves. I mean, for, for example, the, the other the other extension were caused by other forces, so they were inflicted on species, then biodiversity recovered, but millions of years after. I mean, it took so long once the meteorites were, were extinguished a lot of life on Earth to recover itself, so it took so long. It's not, yes, it is just a point on this image, but this point is equivalent to million of years. And so that's why I think that images are very dangerous in terms of communication, because people do think that this means it, it recovers after, so it's okay. I mean, we're going to recover. 
But this took so many thousands, a billion of years. So we self-inflicting something. I don't know if it, it, it was that you meant. But we self-inflicting something that will cost us a lot of lives, of human life, not only human. But if we disappear, I mean, there is a lot of change that uh, biodiversity will recover. Which one, we don't know. But uh, so time and biodiversity is very important. The second image is about levels of biodiversity. Do you know the three levels of biodiversity? When we study biodiversity, we study different levels. Which one? No idea? What? No, we study genetics, species, ecosystem. This is, these are the three levels of the organization of life. It's how we understand uh, life, ecosystem, species, genetics. So when we look at biodiversity, you can, for example, some colleagues do look at species, but if you want to do it extensively, because biodiversity is also the conservation of genes, uh, and especially when you talk of plants, uh, you need to take into account the different levels of organization. And this is the last um, panel of uh, what you have to take into account when you talk about biodiversity. It's the chain. It's not only the food chain. It can be also, for example, this animal do contribute to the fertility of the soil, do contribute to the fact that there are trees, do bring seeds elsewhere in order to propagate species. So levels, time, and chain is uh, some you know, words you can keep in your mind in order to, to, to understand what is about in uh, biodiversity. OK, so I'm not going into details. Maybe my colleague will do it later on. What is an ecosystem? Uh, uh, this is just to tell you that we have a very, uh, very, uh, we have uh, what we call vertebrate-centric vision of biodiversity, because insects are 85% of animal biodiversity, so mostly they are insects when we talk of, bio of biodiversity. But they're so, we don't know them. I mean, mostly we don't know them, we don't like them, and we ignore them mostly. And so we focus on big animals like that, who are disappearing. I mean, uh, we, for example, if you teach your kids about lions and uh, stuff like that, that's not the reality of nature around you. I mean, it's just a fiction, a human fiction, nonetheless. <laughs> So it's uh, a very, very, uh, the vertebrates are a small group in terms of biodiversity. Um, so erosion of biodiversity, five factors. The first one is uh, overexploitation, but also land use. The, the report of the IPCC in 2018 was mainly about land use, and they said that if we tackle this issue of land use and try to preserve some land out of exploitation, we may succeed in terms of biodiversity erosion, but not only, also of climate change. You can read this report. I think it was uh, one of the most interesting reports uh, that uh, did the IPCC. So this is one of the codes. You recognize it. And still, even if periurbanization is a big cause for erosion of biodiversity, you can see the difference between these two houses. One is letting everything grow around it, and the other one is trying to erase everything around it. 
And still, it's a small thing, but it can preserve biodiversity at a small level. And this is your future breakfast without pollinizator. And this is where you have pollinizator. So, I mean, it will be deprived uh, of uh, many things you use to. And uh, one study which has uh, been released quite recently, not so recently, is about uh, the evolution of uh, diseases uh, in different parts of the world according to the uh, decrease of animal uh, pollinizator. So it means that in a northern country, it will be mostly uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. And so, but in a thousand countries like that, it will be uh, mostly infectious disease and such. So we'll have uh, uh, diseases nonetheless. I mean, it's trying to see what kind of model we could uh, draw out of, out of that. Okay. So this is what I was telling you about mosquito, which has been, uh, I'm, tr I'm working also on mosquito in the southern part of France and how this mosquito has been evolving with pesticides, because uh, the only mosquito which do survive are the ones which are resistant to this mosquito, so they're driving new evolution. And so you can see pesticide in insect like a race. You know, evolution is a race against uh, tools of uh, human beings against nature. I mean, uh, that's something which is quite interesting. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going. Okay, I'll uh, finish and then we'll discuss uh, different things before my colleague arrives. So, uh, why do, uh, once again, uh, why are we, uh, why do we stand at this place nowadays? I mean, I am an ecologist and an ecological uh, scientist since the 90s. I thought uh, that it was impossible. I naively thought that it was impossible. I, I, st I started my study, I was the first PhD on nature in cities in the 90s. I first, first thought it was impossible that human beings did not would not react to what was coming until 2010. And this was a moment of depression. Then uh, again, you go fighting. And you wonder why did we not react? And, and it's still a question for me. I mean, why do we not act upon what sounds as being the worst catastrophe which will come upon us? And it's something which is vertiginous, vertiginous, uh, metaphysical uh, as a species. It's not only a political question, it's metaphysical, I would say. I have, uh, and you can say that oil producing countries have interest in not slowing down the production of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of oil. Uh, you can say uh, that is uh, an economic and in industrial matter because we need to change the way we produce and consume and it is too much to change. Maybe we're not able to change uh, if we're not forced to, I don't know. And maybe the fact that governments do not seem to act so much means that we don't feel like we have to act so much because we're used to this father figure and we think that if our parents do not act, we do not need to act. I'm talking, uh, even if I am old, much older than you, I'm talking even for myself. Uh, we're talking about disinformation. Uh, we're talking about many things, uh, cognitive dissonance, maybe you have heard about this, it is very much studied in psychology, how we can know something and do the contrary, for example, we know that smoking do bring cancers, but we do smoke. Uh, 
trying to, to, to diminish the impact it could have. For example, we say, it's just one cigarette, I do smoke. So I know very well. Uh, we, we say it's one cigarette, it doesn't matter, or whatever, I'm going to die one day. Uh, uh, you can say all kind of things. So, I mean, there are many reasons why we do not act, but that's something you will have to, 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 to work with, because uh, nonetheless, it will be the main preoccupation in the decades to come. Uh, there are networks of actors who are doing things. Uh, it's usually mostly at uh, non-state uh, non actors, uh, like city actors, for example, have been playing a role. Why do you think they have been playing a role in these issues? Do you have an idea? And then I'll stop talking, I promise. Because it's, easy, it's easier to see the consequences of climate change at a local level. Yeah, and you have to manage them. It's also because, for example, Paris, it's supposed to be over 50 degrees by 2030, meaning a lot of people are going to die because it's the most lethal city of Europe regarding climate uh, issue, uh, warming issue, because it's so mineral. I mean, uh, there are, uh, the Lancet, which is uh, uh, the one who are going to die, are the one in the poor countries, so it doesn't matter so much, uh, and such and such. You find all kinds of views when you're in this field in, since a long time. There are really crazy views. I mean, uh, and also it raises the issue of science. Uh, what kind of education to science do we have to have? And I think it's a very important issue uh, because uh, in the 1980s and afterwards, some people have said that uh, uh, traditional beliefs in, uh, in the countryside, for example, do uh, have the same values and science but uh, I think that we have to be careful about saying that because uh, science do verify what it says and it says something which is not a religion but a way to envision what is around us. I mean, tools of science have limits, obviously, but it's still a way to verify what you think. And this idea of verification is very, very important. So, okay, so now I'm just going to give you an overview of what you're going to tackle with. So today, uh, this was the introduction. Uh, François is arriving at uh, 4 or 4.15, uh, I don't know. So, and uh, you have a course about biodiversity. I don't know, I'll uh, wait for him until he arrives and I will have to, to go. You have this course about energy, climate and social transformation. He's a physician, he's a specialist of nuclear, nuclear uh, energy. Uh, he's very engaged also, he's a quite cool guy, I think. Uh, this is Nathalie, she is a specialist of uh, climate change. She will mostly show you models and how to calculate what is global warming. Uh, global health is very much and more an issue. Do you know what is global health? No? It's not health at the global level for once, it's not that. So I give you a clue, no? Uh, global health means uh, interrelated health, mostly. Uh, health of the ecosystem equals health of the human beings equals global health means tackling with the interrelated components of health. You understand? I mean, it's like, uh, for example, uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, sickness, they say that it was because the forest had been destroyed and bat bats have been uh, uh, driven crazy and going elsewhere. I mean, everything is related and it's uh, what is tackling global health. Brazilian woman farmer, she's a social scientist. 
uh, and she works very much in a feminist perspective in the global south, in, in Bra Brazilian countries, and she talks about uh, reprimarization of the economy, reprimarization of economy, meaning that until now, until the 2000, uh, the, the thousand country have been pushed towards becoming a uh, more developed country. And because of the needs of northern countries to green themselves, they pushed again towards uh, exploiting uh, uh, material uh, uh, like lithium, like nickel, like, like different things. <laughs> And it has a big impact on women. And she will tell you about that, why this reprimarization de l'économie has a big impact on women. Social metabolism, you know maybe about that? N Nelo Magalaj, he just uh, defended his PhD, is a bright young researcher, he works about flux of matters, different matters, so you will... Uh, uh, is also a young colleague, uh, is a social scientist. Uh, it will talk about land concentration. For example, 70 percent of Scotland is owned by three or four persons of the land. So, I mean, the land concentration from a land justice perspective, it is a big issue. Who owns the land? Uh, and uh, it's in England, for especially in UK, I mean, it's very disequilibrated. Uh, for historical reason, it's less disequilibrated in France, for example. My colleague will talk about plastic. Uh, so you will have a full narrative about the, where the plastic comes and where it goes. It's very engaged, so do not bring plastic this day. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be here. So my other colleague uh, is about critical zone. He's a geochemist. Uh, and he's a very bright and recognized colleague. And he talks about how uh, what we call the critical zone is the land between the atmosphere and the geological uh, forces. So how do this zone where we live, we live on the soil, uh, and we live on this small portion of the earth. You know, we live in between two meters, or met, meton, the height of a tower, and the subway. So we live there, only there. Uh, so, and we'll talk about this critical zone. So this is my delightful colleague who works on peace, and he will show you how we can use peace. Uh, and we starting in Paris to separate uh, feces, feces from peace in order to use it as a, as a nutrient, uh, because it is a huge resource. Because otherwise we fabricate uh, azote, for example, uh, to, 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 to put into culture, because to nourish the cultures, but if we put peace, it will be much better. And it will bring you cookies, which have been done with peace, and you oblige to eat them. <laughs> I tell you, each year he does that, so you will have a do whatever. <laughs> And uh, my colleague, Natasha, is a political science, and she will talk again about planetary boundaries. She, was, uh, she is very good about it. This girl, this lady, Anne Lestrat, was the uh, head, uh, left hand of the mayor of Paris for a long time, and she uh, remunicipalized, remunicipalized uh, the, the water of Paris. So she was very strong against capitalism uh, uh, and the use of water. So she has a very good experience of it. And then the last, uh, it's, uh, it's the only guy I don't know, in fact. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, 
building and uh, I guess he is more about uh, engineer. Okay, so you will have all these courses and in January, uh, I will assess what you have learned during these courses. And uh, because I am uh, engaged, obviously, I would like you to talk about engagement. I would like you in, uh, individually, or in small groups, no more than three, uh, that uh, you present uh, a case study, either of your country or another case study, if you want, something you know well, uh, and which is uh, a cause of engagement. Uh, that, uh, that you analyze why uh, it has taken place, why uh, it is a success or a failure, uh, and why do you what do you think are the levers of success for this mobilization, and what kind of transformation did they bring? I mean, uh, do things, do think in terms of levers of transformation. What makes a mobilization a success? What makes an engagement a success? What kind of transformation does it bring? At what scale do you have to think about it? So you can use different narrative. Uh, some used, uh, last year we worked on something else, but the year before we worked on engagement too. Um, we, some worked on science fiction and some fictional engagement. Uh, you decide and you will have to present it in January, end of January, in front of the other students. Uh, uh, and you will have to, to, to send us beforehand, but not so much beforehand, because you will have a lot of work this year, a poster or something which uh, is uh, uh, permits to, uh, for other students. So we'll put all posters uh, in a place and you will present uh, each of you or each binomes or trinomes uh, the case of engagement. So, do you know what is engagement? How do you, did you ever work about engagement? What is engagement? What does it mean, engagement? There are uh, uh, literature big like this room on that issue, at least big like this room. Yes? So, Yeah, but you could say that, uh, uh, so you, you can read different books or you can read, it's interesting to work on engagement <laughs> because I was part of the Citizen Convention on Climate Issues. We were like 150 citizens trying to evolve, to teach themselves about an issue and some had trouble even to read. So very different class were brought together, were brought together and tried to think about what was the issue. And a lot of them, 10% at the end of the convention engaged in politics. I mean, which means a big conversion. Certain, certain person were electrician or were other jobs and they did understand. So, if you think about what is engagement, what does it mean? When I tell you that, what does it mean? Is it some exterior cause or is it something else? Yes? It's doing a task in context. Of yeah. It's not only a task because what I tell you about this convention, it's people change identity. I mean, an engagement, a, a real engagement, is not just to commit oneself to what someone else is also to say, this is what I am going to commit myself to. Not only my time, but the time of my life. I mean, me, I am engaged in terms, I have devoted my own life to the ecological issues. This 
structure, my, my identity, my social identity, my personal identity. Even my daughter hates it. <laughs> so, yes? Maybe a question. Do you mean mostly civil society engagement or also like professional or like students or...? It can be students. Uh, it can be professional. What I mean by engagement, that's why I, 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 I do try to make my point, it's not only to sign up a, 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 a petition or, you know, it's more deep, it's deeper. It means that you uh, uh, you, you, you're engaging yourself, you're committing yourself for change. You think that you're able to do it, but also you accept the fact that it will change you and your place in society. For example, I can't be in a room with very rich people because uh, three minutes after I am with them, I try to tackle, the, to, to, to tell them how bad they are. So, I mean, it changed everything, you know. It changed your view on the world. So, engagement is something which is a, a social identity too, yes? So to study people that have engaged and uh, to try to show how much it uh, changed everything in their lives but also uh, what effect they had on whatever they engaged for. So uh, I will need, uh, I would need also, I mean uh, I can provide, uh, I, I, yeah, I can provide put for two master theses uh, if you're willing to work on two. I have two topics to deal with this year. I'm working with the city hall uh, and Andy Nan, Antoine, je sais plus comment on dit. Uh, and I'm working, I did with the city hall last year something, a booklet, which was with, uh, done in collaboration with the different departments of the city of Paris about popular classes and uh, socio-ecological transition. So it's public, you can read it, I can send it to you. And I told them that I wouldn't do it. It was presented by the mayor last year in June. Uh, and I told them I wouldn't do it if we couldn't collaborate on two other booklets. And so I am recruiting for that one on uh, rich class and uh, socio-ecological transition and one with, uh, on middle class and socio-ecological transition. Because I didn't want just to, I mean, the popular class are the one which are contributing the less to this issue. So I wanted to see how we can compare, try to. So if you want to do an internship about this issue, uh, I will be uh, willing. And about uh, rich class, uh, wealthy classes, uh, we are a group of scientists. Some will do quantitative analysis. Uh, some will do uh, qualitative analysis. So there is a group behind. Uh, another thing that I have to say, let me see, no, I forgot, <laughs> well. Sorry, where is the internship to be happening? Here, in, the, in this university, it will be with the city hall. Uh, it's better, I mean, to discuss with the different uh, departments of Paris. Uh, it's easier if you talk French, obviously, but uh, you, you'll see. Uh, there is another thing is which I am coordinating. Uh, which is called the school territory. Some of you have heard through Joachim. So the idea is the following. Uh, I am bringing uh, 15 to 20 students to a place. Uh, I will tell you the place after this year. Each year I do that since uh, 30 years. So it's, uh, uh, we call that, uh, 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 it's uh, uh, in command, in public command, public order. Uh, for example, natural park, do tell me we need to know better about our public and which kind of animal do they come to see. For example, uh, I don't know, uh, whatever animals. 
Uh, last year, for, to give you an example, we had the order of the Brussels big community, urban community, and they wanted to know b more about the uh, effectivity of the public policy on biodiversity. So they asked the group to work on that. So if you work on that, if you commit on that, it means that you start to work on documents with the other colleagues on, in geography, in biology, in uh, sociology also, uh, in ecology. Uh, and you work on this topic. Uh, last year it was about biodiversity in Brussels. Uh, this year I will, I will tell you about what it is. Uh, and then you spend 15 days in beginning of February in the place we pay for you. Uh, so you don't have to, to pay for housing or anything. We just uh, do the, that and we bring you to the place and you present in front of the uh, civil servants uh, what you have done, the collective work you have done. So it's uh, challenging sometimes. Uh, and it's true that it, uh, last year it was in Brussels. This year it will be in Brittany. Uh, this year we will work in a very, very funny place which is called La Ferme de Kermini, near Quimper. It's, uh, you see Brittany, it's like that. It's there, at the end, near the end uh, of Brittany, Quimper. So this is a farm which has been bought by two activists, uh, five activists, in fact, but two of them are very present, who are also artists. They have bought this castle it's a castle of the 10th century, I think. It's a magnificent place, but very ruined. <laughs> so uh, there are many rooms. Uh, you, you will sleep there and everything. And to try to see how uh, it is an engagement. I mean, there are very engaged people. How this place can uh, bring uh, an alternative uh, to uh, the region. At what condition, really? I mean, they have, uh, so they have the castle, they have 12 uh, hectares, uh, they have brought permaculture, bakery, and other things. Uh, they're trying to work with l'atelier paysan. Do you know what's l'atelier paysan? It's an uh, NGO in France who work with low tech and try to teach uh, farmers how to work with low tech and not uh, so expensive uh, technologies in order for them to become more autonomous. Uh, so if you want to go to this cool territory, you have to comply to this different, uh, discuss with the colleagues of different disciplines, form a group and spend there uh, in Brittany, in the castle, some days to study uh, with the artists and other activists to other. So this is it. Who is? Uh, yeah? For this specific job, uh, is French fluency also sufficient? It's better, at least that you understand, because you will have to meet the farmers, the local farmers who are hard headed, <laughs> I tell you because they want to use pesticides, so you will have to understand why they use pesticides. Uh, I mean, I, I had a workshop last year there. It's uh, very uh, confrontational. You can see that. I mean, uh, uh, they think that their role is to feed the world, so they don't care about the... because they are the fishermen also, because the fish are dying and they can't fish anything because Brittany is very polluted and all the pollution is going in the rivers and in the seas and the, then the fishermen can't fish anymore. I mean, it's like the whole cycle. So who would be interested? Yes? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to ask, is there like an application process or something? You send to me. Okay. And... Uh, and uh, I will be there with you the 15 days, nonetheless. Uh, 
it's a bit cold because there is no, it's a real castle of the 10th century, uh, which has been uh, reconstructed throughout, but it's very old, meaning walls like that and cold like that too. <laughs> so you have to be, uh, so who would be interested to go? Okay, a lot of you. Okay, send me and you tell me why you're interested. Uh, you send me the application, you tell me why you're interested. Uh, I'll send you also some uh, details. If you go, you should go on the site of Ferme de Kermini. Uh, <coughs> let me write it down for you. So it's a Ferme Artistique, en fait. Ferme de Kermini. Uh, ferme, it's a form, de K, uh, K E R M I N Y. You can find it online. Uh, let me check. I'm going to show it to you. I think I am online. Um, so, so, so. And uh, the guy, one of the artists is a sound maker, uh, a musician, and he does music with his ve vegetables. <laughs> and uh, she's a dancer, mostly. I'm going to show you. So I don't know if it's going to work because it sounds very... Uh, Il marche jamais, c'est chiant ça. Ah, uh, bienvenue. Do, are there are no images. C'est nul ça. And also, it's better to 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 be able to talk in uh, to to speak French uh, because uh, you will have to, to to talk with the other colleagues, the one who are ecologists, uh, will have the duty to see what kind of uh, biodiversity there is there and, and stuff like that. So. Okay, I wanted to show you the image, but uh, you will find it by yourself, I guess, because I can't find it like that. So send me your application. Also for the engagement uh, issue, you can send me uh, what you intend to work on. Uh, you can work on many topics like uh, engagement for climate, biodiversity, uh, animal life, uh, vegetarianism, uh, uh, with things which are related to ecological issues. So it's nuclear, it can be, uh, I mean, there are so many issues, you have the choice. And uh, describe what is this engagement and really be pedagogical because the issue is important nowadays that we know what are the levels of engagement and how should we accompany uh, the people who are engaging themselves at different levels. Okay, are there other questions or we can stop there until uh, we wait for... Yes? Around 20 minutes. Yes? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Joachim, we let... So... So it's N-A-T-H-A-L-I, no E at the end, dot... B-L-A-N-C at 
when I do dot fr. But th there is no e on Nathalie, because, uh, and uh, be aware that the spelling uh, do correct it every time, and so I don't receive the emails, which is good sometimes. <laughs> yes? Uh, Uh, Joachim gave it uh, for, to, to bring the PowerPoint, you mean? Yes, the PowerPoint. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, I should be able to do it. He sent me the, the, the link to the next cloud. It seems very barbaric, yeah? no? <laughs> I mean, I found not very, very nice. Yes? No, no, but uh, I would like to have it before the, before the end of the year, because it will be for the end of January. So if you send me your topic uh, beginning of December, that's good. Is it just the topic, not the presentation? No, no, no. And then you will send me the presentation in January. Yeah. That I know, I mean, how we organize ourselves and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you can have a theater play, yes, <laughs> if you're able to do it. It's a very tough, I mean, yeah, invite your friend and do display something like of his own engagement with you and do a play. I mean, some colleagues did it last year. That wasn't my question. My question was how academic, so like... No, I mean, it doesn't have to be too academic. If you want to do a theater play, that's good. <laughs> that would be fun, in fact. I mean, use the codes and, I mean, you have to think when you talk of engagement uh, that you have to be persuasive. Somehow, when you talk of engagement, you're trying to persuade the other that he should be engaged too. So there is something to do with that. Yes? Can it be a recent thing or can it be like a... Reason? Recent. Oh, recent. No, it doesn't have to be recent. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But uh, depends on the data you, you, you have access to. I mean, uh, personal data and uh, it's... Uh, so even uh, people like uh, Carson do, did get engaged because she, she, she... I mean, there are plenty of people you can discuss the engagement, yes. You have to find a group dy dynamic. For example, if you, uh, I was thinking of Janus. Do you know Janus? It's a god with two heads. Mm -hmm. So if you and your friend are playing Janus, if one say yes, the other has to say no. That's like a play, a group dynamic. I mean, uh, it's uh, something, you're making a show. I mean, it can be conference, it can be a discussion, it can be a theater play. You have to decide, but it has to be convincing. Uh, it can be about two different things if it is related somehow, if you make them related. For example, one is on engaged for nuclear and the other one is engaged against. I mean, but it's too... Are there other questions? Yes? Uh, can you, for example, like a, a continuation of the question, uh, can we, for example, take two countries and like compare how they, like in both countries, they had different engagement types and how they tackled the issue, but it's the same issue? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what is interesting in this case, because I did it, is to see how much the context, the political context, did play a role in the form of engagement. Uh, because in France, for example, engagement is very constrained. So, and it's not the case so much in Germany, for example. Yes? So for this course, uh, we will have this as an evaluation, but will we have other evaluations, or this is going to be the main one? Main one. Okay, perfect. So you, you, you just uh, need to convince me of, uh, okay. <laughs> which is very tough. <laughs> Are there other questions? 
Absence. 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 How many classes you? Uh, uh, it's uh, me with uh, the headmaster, so you should ask David Fleshy. I think he can be quite strict about it. You should ask him. Huh? <laughs> I'm not. Uh, so uh, the, the school territory you choose. You come, you don't come. It's not. Uh, it's your choice. But uh, being here and uh, attending these courses, uh, I think it's uh, compulsory. You have to see with him. So thank you, everyone. And uh, let's take a break before Francois comes. Uh, thank you.